and I uh, welcome you to um, this afternoon's um, lecture presentation by Jan Machacek. Um, Jan Machacek uh, is currently a, a journalist, uh, has been a journalist uh, going back to the 1980s. Um, he writes for an investigative uh, weekly called uh, Respect. He also uh, teaches in uh, Prague's uh, uh, New York University uh, program. And uh, uh, he, in his spare time, um, uh, plays in a rock band uh, called The Garage. Um, he has uh, uh, been uh, an unusual, um, uh, his has been an unusual journey. And I'd like to say just a few words about it without uh, taking away uh, the time that uh, his presentation um, uh, is going to uh, uh, require. Um, he, uh, uh, during the communist regime, um, got involved in uh, underground uh, culture and in uh, some is that uh, publishing. Um, earlier this afternoon, he uh, spoke to some of us in, in my seminar on comparative democratization about those very activities um, where uh, uh, he and, uh, and other young people were actually uh, uh, putting out uh, uh, well, uncensored uh, material in the underground, um, publications concerning uh, uh, what otherwise the censored press uh, in uh, the mid-late uh, 1980s would not allow to appear. Um, he had uh, also uh, joined um, a, uh, the, in the underground music uh, scene, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, in particular, he uh, joined a, uh, today a famous uh, band called the Plastic People of the Universe, um, which uh, uh, was uh, uh, some years earlier um, actually uh, uh, attacked by the regime, and uh, it, uh, a number of a uh, number of its uh, uh, band players were arrested. Uh, the event in 1977 uh, led to the uh, issuance of Charter 77, a human rights manifesto, which Jan Machacek uh, also uh, signed. Um, so he didn't make his, uh, owing to his convictions, he didn't make his life any easier for himself under the communist regime. And then uh, he uh, became, uh, uh, soon after the 1989 revolution, a prominent uh, uh, journalist in the, uh, uh, particularly in, in, in the uh, uh, weekly, investigative weekly called uh, Respect. Um, he, uh, uh, I uh, joined, um, in fact, co-founded uh, this uh, journal, which was the first independent media outlet, which played a very important role. And uh, there, as well as in some other, on account of some other publications, he won a number of um, uh, prizes and, and recognition. Um, he has been a fellow at the National uh, Forum Foundation in Washington, and he also uh, was a fellow at the William Davidson Institute at the University of Michigan. Um, he, uh, 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 in his uh, spare time, uh, serves uh, as a board member of uh, Transparency International in the Czech Republic, which is uh, an organization dedicated to monitoring uh, corruption. Um, and uh, much of uh, the focus of his writings um, uh, has to do with uh, economic and financial affairs. So actually, if we wanted to change the subject and wanted to talk about the collapse of the uh, financial system um, as we are living through it, uh, he has in fact he's in fact he has in fact considerable expertise on that subject. He's been uh, writing pieces about it even from here uh, for Czech uh, for the Czech press. But his subject today, uh, the one that he's come to uh, share with us, is Europe, Russia, and energy security. Uh, he'll take about 30 minutes to talk about this, um, and then uh, there's going to be uh, 
I will open the floor to questions. The, his talk today is sponsored by the Rohitan Center for International Affairs, uh, by our Russian and East European Studies Program, by the Department of Political Science, as well as by the European Studies Program. I'm delighted to welcome Jan Machacek uh, in our midst. Thank you, Professor Kraus, and uh, thanks for the uh, invitation and uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, is it loud enough? Okay. So, uh, uh, when uh, Michael Kraus mentioned that I, I am writing also about the U.S. Uh, or European financial crisis, the reason I enjoy the topic is there are actually like many, many similarities uh, even though it sounds absurd, uh, after the communism fell in 1990s, uh, we had many bank failures. We even have a fear of systemic bank failure. So all these things like how to increase deposit insurance, how to divide a good part of the bank from a, a bad part of the bank, uh, all these like attacking banking socialism. So uh, I was uh, writing about it in the 1990s and when these days uh, often what is being uh, talked about here is a Swedish example of 1990s with the banking crisis. There is also a lot of similarities with the banking crisis in Czech Republic, even though we, unlike Sweden, couldn't serve as a positive example, but like a negative example, <laughs> but uh, mostly. So any examples are good. But uh, it has been a month ago when I, or six weeks ago when I offered the, this topic of the lecture. And... Uh, as you know, I'm, uh, or as you can imagine, I'm covering many topics, but uh, the reason I picked up this uh, topic is that I think it's a very important topic for the future development of, especially of post-communist countries, in, uh, and uh, it is underestimated both globally and uh, in Czech politics. And... Uh, I extensively write about it, but uh, the perspective I am usually, usually using in, in Czech press is that I am criticizing our government and our politicians that they are not uh, putting uh, much attention to this crucial topic. And if they pay an attention to it, it's only talking. It's words and there is no basically practical impact. Uh, as you see, uh, I, uh, the title of the lecture says Europe, Central Europe. So obviously since I am coming from Central Europe, I would pay more attention to Central Europe while I would only mention Spain or Greece and countries like this. As you, so also we have 30 minutes time, so there is, I cannot be that global. So, uh, First, uh, we should start with the defin definition of the term uh, energy security. Actually, tomorrow I'm speaking at the University of, the Mi of Michigan and Professor Schweiner asked me that I should make a very lively uh, PowerPoint presentation. So I did it. So it seems to me that it looks a little bit like for kids, but maybe it would be <laughs> helpful to uh, understand. So the, here I'm trying to say that uh, there is no global consensus about like what energy security means. Obviously, uh, it, uh, it is in that way that what is energy security for someone is obviously energy insecurity for someone else. So uh, usually it means that uh, we are talking about dependency or energy independence. You know that it's a big topic in the US. That's the way you guys uh, call it. And uh, and when we speak about dependency, dependency as such maybe is not a problem, but you, the t problem is a dependency on a particular territory. Uh, another kind of dependency is too much dependency of particular source of uh, energy. Uh, if someone is not un wouldn't understand anything, like be uh, ready to interrupt me. It's, uh, there's no problem about it. Another topic uh, which has to do with energy security is diversification of resources and diversification of territories, obviously. But uh, there is a, uh, some countries, some societies, some, some parts of societies 
if they speak about energy security, it means something completely different. It's, uh, it means a fight with global warming. And if you are living in Holland, for instance, it's, uh, you can imagine that people in Holland think that energy t security is mostly they think that it is how to guarantee their country against uh, flooding from high seas. Also, what is important connected to this topic are uh, savings. But uh, since we are talking about uh, democracies and market economies, these savings are usually not uh, mentioned as a goal as, uh, in itself, but uh, we are speaking about savings which are uh, compatible with some kind of economic uh, growth because uh, we know that uh, if, uh, there is a no, if there is no economic growth, usually it has a negative impact also on the, on the quality of uh, society and democracy. So that's why you have there these pictures. Uh, this polar bear has to do with global warming, as you know. And uh, the, this picture uh, is connected to the dependency to territories, because whereas I would speak today about dependency on Russia, some countries are feared about too much dependency of Middle East uh, and uh, countries of that region. So uh, I mentioned that uh, priorities and understanding of the, of the term energy security are different and sometimes uh, contradictory in particular countries. <clears throat> for France and mainly for Spain, which is like importing 90% of natural gas, for instance, more than 90% from, from countries like Algeria, we had a pi pipeline under the Mediterranean Sea. It's obviously, if they speak about energy security in Spain, they, most of the people think that it's uh, it, uh, they must, uh, uh, how to keep or make uh, the countries of North Africa, which is a provider of the most important resources, how to make these countries stable, perhaps how to diversify their resources if something happens there. For Great Britain, mostly energy dependency uh, or energy security means that uh, sin since it's a, uh, country with uh, many ports, since it's an island, since it has resources of its, of its own. What uh, Brits are proposing when they speak about this topic on the level of European Union is maximum deregulation, competition, privatization, and deregulation in a sense that uh, uh, small companies, small independent companies should import or trade uh, with energy and, uh, and it would mean, so they are looking at, at, at the problem from trade perspective. So which means that uh, if you have many independent traders which are, which are doing business with, with, these, uh, with these products, it makes uh, a country uh, safer in the long term. I mentioned already that in case of Holland, for instance, it usually means fear of floods and high seas if uh, Scandinavian, Scandinavians are talking about this topic because uh, Scandin Scandinavians are very like organized uh, people and very, very uh, people are not obsessed with having everything now at, and etc. The level of savings also with, uh, in financial sector is quite high in Scandinavia. So Scandinavia and, and the best example by the way is I believe Denmark are focused on fighting the energy security dependency with energy savings. So country is using all instruments available from tax instruments to budget instruments to invest into energy savings. So uh, uh, for instance, in uh, Denmark, what, uh, it's not only about light bulbs which are sa saving energy, but uh, Denmark is well known for for that it grows a lot of pigs. So pigs farming in Greymark are sort of uh, organized in a complicated technical way that it also creates uh, heating. There is, there is no, uh, there is no, um, 
no energy is d disappearing and, and so so they they constantly come with very complicated schemes and Denmark you know, Danish people themselves uh, Danish government says that while uh, a country is growing economically by the way it's at this moment in the recession but normally it's growing so uh, it it grows and and overall energy consumption is go going down but Denmark is also accused by other countries that that it uh, it is uh, not true that uh, that it's the it depends on the way you look at it uh, for when I mentioned that there are countries who even have uh, like contradictory interests and contradictory understanding of the term i uh, that would have to do with uh, Germans and Italians because it seems to me that uh, uh, for Germany they think that countries of Middle East are insecure, which they are, and whereas we Germans know how to handle Russians, we know how to do business with them, so we are doing safe business deals with Russians, and it's energy security uh, for us. The same goes into an extent with Italians. Uh, so for Germans, Germans are not scared of, uh, of Russians, uh, because uh, they know they can do business with them. Whereas uh, uh, we spoke a little bit uh, about it at the dinner yesterday with, uh, with Michael Krauss and uh, Mr. Davidov. So I can briefly, can sp perhaps it has also historical uh, uh, reasons, because if you look at the Second World War, perhaps it was just a little strange period in a history of uh, relationships between Germany and Russia. Uh, whereas uh, before the uh, Second World War in 1930s, you know that Germans, uh, where there was a lot of military cooperation between Russia and Germany, there was a lot of uh, military training, German specialists were helping the uh, Soviet army. The Blitzkrieg was actually trained paradoxically in, uh, in Russia, but uh, even in the history you, have, uh, you know about the division of the Poland, uh, division of Poland three times, etc. So perhaps, even though we, if we look at it, and which is impossible, but we try to forget the perspective or, or the period of the of the of the Second World War. There is this like tradition that that uh, Germans know how to do business uh, with uh, Russians, and the Russians never attacked uh, Germany, uh, and. Um, if Germans attack Russians, it was because of Hitler or it was some kind of like uh, something strange happened. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, the opposite uh, is uh, a perspective of uh, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary perhaps, that uh, these countries are perhaps are not objective. I cannot tell because I'm I am coming from that country, but there is a fear of too much dependency on Russia. But if you look at the numbers later on, we would actually see that there is too much dependency on Russia, and it is uh, very dangerous, especially in situation when Russia is becoming very assertive, as we know from uh, recent history, and it's uh, sort of uh, full of strength, come, which is coming from all these oil and natural gas uh, petrodollars, as it is called. <clears throat> I just briefly can mention USA because you know you guys live here. So I, when I'm watching TV or here, uh, read newspapers here, you, uh, energy security is mentioned usually like energy independence, uh, how to do it to make country independent on and less dependent on unstable regime in Central Asia, how to make it less dependent on Venezuela, for instance. So uh, now I would try to explain like why, uh, why, why is that, that uh, from a perspective of Central Europe, uh, Russian uh, interests and too much uh, dependency can be uh, considered uh, dangerous because big companies in, uh, in Russia, uh, you know, are not uh, private companies which are controlled by shareholders and capital markets, etc. But these are partially or fully state-owned companies 
which are under the direct influence of the state. And state, in the case of Russia, means uh, uh, influence of former KGB uh, clique around Putin and uh, his cooperatives. So these people are in control of these major important companies. These people are, are working hard to make uh, Russia more influential in the world. They are using their energy resources to uh, promote sort of Russia, uh, Russian dominance, to conquer back not ter territories with the tanks, but the, to conquer back some, uh, uh, some influence, to have upper hand of, of these like former Soviet satellites, for instance. Uh, if I mention the word Gazpromistan, we know that current Russian president uh, Medvedev is a former chairman of Gazprom, Gazprom, which is a Russian producer of and exporter of natural gas, and he very well understands all these uh, links. Uh, Gazocracy is basically a similar term like Gazpromistan. It means that uh, uh, There is a special way of uh, rule of law in Russia. There is a special rule of law for elites, which has to do something with the government and natural resources. And there is a special rule of law for normal people. Uh, perhaps you will later on have, a, have more time to go into details about it. But also, uh, we had uh, a direct experience like with uh, Ukraine. You know that a couple of times uh, there were very harsh disputes between, uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia about, uh, about the payments and deliveries of natural gas, sometimes all but mainly of natural gas. It's usually somehow strangely or coincidentally connected with uh, influencing Ukrainian political scene. And it's, uh, I would try to portray later that uh, even though uh, these, these deals are usually not made transparently in between government and between uh, governments and state agencies, so there are like uh, usually uh, complicated uh, corporated structures incorporated in Switzerland usually which are trading with each other. So it's very hard to evaluate really if uh, Ukrainian is delayed with its payment for natural gas, as Russia says, if Ukrainians are not paying it time. But uh, Russia, Gazprom is using these arguments to, to uh, at use them in recent years two times, where it basically uh, halved uh, the deliveries of natural gas to Ukraine into uh, like for less than 50 percent. But it had a major impact for all the countries which are using nature, Russian natural gas which is going through Ukraine. So Western Europe was scared because deliveries to Western Europe from Austria to Italy dropped to 35% unless, uh, until, uh, until Ukraine and Russia uh, actually successfully uh, handled the dispute. But uh, I think the political goal was to portray Ukraine and as unstable and unreliable partner and dangerous territory. So, uh, speaking about numbers, uh, I should tell you my recent experience. It's very complicated to get uh, numbers. There are no, uh, especially it's, uh, you, you have many uh, different uh, uh, means of uh, energy and all of them are measured differently. There is especially the with natural gas that if the contracts are very long term for five years, 10 years, 15 years, the price is very, uh, 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 related to this fact, and these giant like business contracts between states sometimes or between state companies are not publicly disclosed. So there is nothing like a stock exchange with natural gas that we would know immediate price and immediate uh, fact. So it also complicates the situation. So I cannot provide you with current statistics with having all the precise numbers. Also, I was contacted Czech government recently created an institution which is called an uh, 
ambassador for energy security, and he uh, his uh, his work is uh, everyone know that this guy exists. He sometimes provides interviews with the press, but his uh, agency doesn't have even web page, and it produces annual report which is secret. So and so it's not very easy to get uh, proper numbers, but. Uh, here uh, you will see an important charge, but uh, on the other hand, you can see that there are there is a uh, percent of domestic consumption which is 108 percent, 105 percent, which uh, seems a little bit absurd. I, I think it has to do with the exporting, but uh, but anyway, on this chart you see uh, Czech Republic that it is getting very badly, and as far as uh, as far as natural gas. It's uh, it's really dangerous the level of dependency on on uh, on natural gas from Russia. If we would uh, sort of subtract uh, uh, that this 108 percent, it's some kind of absurd or nonsense. We would get anyway to 80 percent or 75 percent, which is also sometimes used. Can I ask a question on that? Yes. Does that mean that percent of domestic consumption of natural gas? Yeah, no, it's a percent of domestic consumption. It's uh, it's how much the country is dependent on on Russian on on Russian natural gas. That's what it is. But it's the same. So eighty percent, eighty four percent of natural gas consumed in Czech Republic is imported from Russia. This chart shows that uh, actually uh, the consumption in, of natural gas in Europe is not projected uh, to get uh, smaller. It would either get stable as this char chart shows, but from other predictions it is predicted to grow. And the reason is clear that uh, natural gas is uh, uh, if we uh, speak about emissions, it's relatively the cleanest source of energy, obviously. It's uh, very, uh, it can be very quickly mobilized. I mean, like I, I would speak later, later on about it in a way uh, when uh, concerning uh, windmills. And, uh, and also there are eager exporters, main, and it's mainly Russia and countries of Central Asia are eager uh, to uh, to get their natural gas exported and offering the, offering it to to Western Europe, and they are working hard on it. Uh, nothing is stable these days as far as, as far as energy resources are concerned. So there is a lot of talk about about uh, having more nuclear power plants. Uh, it's uh, France is, for instance, a traditional country in. In Europe, which uh, which is using more than 50% of uh, its energy resources uh, are produced by uh, by nuclear power plants, but uh, France state-owned company uh, ADF two weeks ago, I believe, it beat bought a company called British Energy, which is a British British producer of uh, of uh, nuclear power, and. Uh, it is being explained, obviously, that uh, it will lead to a situation that new nuclear power plants are, will be constructed on British territory. In Germany, they, they still have a block on new, new uh, nuclear power plants, but it is expected to be, uh, be cancelled. But politically, it's a very complicated topic. It's the same case in our country, where we have a Green Party in coalition, which is also opposing renewing uh, or, or uh, constructing new nuclear power plants. So, uh, but uh, there are teams in the European Union who are working on these projects and so you can, you can see that there is perhaps a very low chance of making Europe as such less dependent on natural gas in the future. When I was speaking about natural gas before, I should also add that uh, that's what makes dependency on natural gas uh, complicated because 
whereas uh, with coal, everyone knows how to store the coal, but with oil, you can store, uh, store the oil, but it's more complicated to store natural gas. It's, it might change, but it's, uh, it's not that easy as with other energy needs. So uh, it is clear these days that, uh, or it is clear to me at least, that uh, it's not any kind of communism which uh, is a threat coming from Russia these days. If, if there is some threat coming from Russia, it will be exporting its political and business culture to their former satellites, which are currently members of European Union and NATO, and uh, to export this uh, kind of business and political culture or some kind of mafia capitalism with some perhaps nationalistic and perhaps even like fascist tendencies. It's easier to be promoted like through owning major companies. So the so it's one thing, but also we, we could have witnessed recently that there are, ma there are many examples of what, what we could call like uh, illiberal democracy in uh, Russia. Uh, there is a control of press and media and space for limited, uh, of free press is uh, very limited, obviously. There is an experience with conflicts with Georgia and uh, Ukraine recently. And uh, I think for Russia it is important to control major companies in these former satellites sooner or later and through these major companies to have an impact on, uh, on the political orientation of the country. So it doesn't mean that overnight that some Russian tanks would come uh, somewhere and overthrow the regime, but the change would be gradual and pressure would grow gradual and therefore it's uh, dangerous to be dependent on on uh, Russia and uh, also historically uh, and uh, we can uh, see it in practice there are very strange uh, uh, there is very strange I believe understanding of, of private property in uh, Russia and uh, uh, so uh, perhaps some people who are of Russian's origin would disagree with me, but it is being said that Russians even don't use a proper name for for ownership or own, I own, because they think things are umenya, utebya, which means that at this moment they are here, maybe later on someone else could take them. But uh, the reason... Uh, so uh, some people think that uh, sort of... Uh, Western civilization understanding of property rights is historically different than understanding of property rights in, in Russia. And, uh, and it has nothing to do, or it has almost nothing to do with, with the heritage of communism. It's uh, deeper, uh, root, more deeply rooted in, uh, in uh, Russian culture. And this is also something Russia could possibly export to, to the, this kind of culture to the former satellites. That uh, there is an upper hand of the government which, at the, in, in fact, the government is the owner of everything, the Tsar is the owner of everything and it, he's just like, he's just uh, giving away some properties for a temporary usage. But I'm obviously overstating, but uh, it's it's a different understanding of the term uh, of, of, of this ownership. The reason I put the photo of Mr. Khodorkovsky in a cell is uh, that uh, is that he is like the best and most well-known example of of someone whose property has been destroyed and uh, taken away. And also, it's not a cell in the prison; it's a cell which is uh, in a courtroom, by the way, which is also very typical for Russia. That you have a you have a court with someone who is sitting within a cell in a courtroom, but it's not doesn't have to do anything with the topic of the lecture.
But it may be it is like also pro, pro, uh, state attorneys in Russia are wearing uniforms, by the way. So uh, in the last two months, this topic of energy dependency has finally uh, become a hot topic uh, in uh, Europe, much uh, more frequent topic than it used to, do, yes, used to do. And it has to do with the conflict uh, in Georgia. I strongly believe that uh, the conflict on Georgia, which uh, was provoked by uh, Russians, which sort of knew that uh, uh, Georgians would, uh, if they would increase all these little conflicts and tensions, that sooner or later they would, uh, they would push uh, Georgian government to do something a little crazy or a little bit crazy or a lot crazy. But uh, it's, there is no doubt about where the conflict was provoked. We can obviously discuss if, if, uh, how uh, Georgian government should respond but it was definitely provoked from Russia. And the most important thing about conflict in Georgia, I believe, is to portray the Georgian regime as unstable, unpredictable, the country to portray the country uh, like, uh, like a country which has constant trouble with uh, ethnic minorities, to portray the country as a way that the uh, president is some kind of an unpredictable psycho, Etc. And the reason for portraying the country this way is to convince European governments and and uh, all the investors that Georgia is not a good country, uh, which uh, strategic, which uh, where strategic pipelines should be located. So I will go into more details about it in a while. This is a very complicated map, as you see, uh, but uh, it, we are not going into uh, details of this map, but uh, it's just uh, supposed to illustrate where uh, energy is uh, going to Europe and Central Europe these days. And, there is, uh, and so you can see that uh, most of the energy which is going to Europe is going through Ukraine, through Be Belarus, through Baltic countries. So that's, what the that's how the situation is these days. This map is showing a Nabucco uh, natural gas pipeline, which uh, is still only a plan, even though the company exists. But uh, the, the, there are many problems with uh, Nabucco. First thing that it uh, there is still not enough money, and the question is like if they, they will ever be enough money to uh, to construct it. So there is uh, the consortium of investors which will construct the pipeline is very unstable. Plus, it has uh, no uh, it has no resources uh, to put stuff into the pipeline guaranteed because the, this pipeline is supposed to use Central Asian resources from Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and uh, resources of natural gas, and export them to Europe while circumventing or bypassing Russia. So this is the m most important thing about this pipeline. This is the most important goal of this pipeline, that it, it is bypassing Russia, as we, as we see on the picture. Uh, there are... Uh, uh, Sometimes in some texts, this uh, this pipeline which you see on the on the map is being uh, sort of prolonged uh, or or put together with a uh, Trans-Caspian pipeline, which which is supposed to go on the bed of the of the um, Caspian uh, Sea and connects uh, Nabucco with Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan. Second reason, uh, 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 so the main reason that uh, na, uh, the main question about Nabucco is, is the fact that uh, Turkmenistan or Kazakh, uh, mainly Turkmenistan, which is the, which is, uh, but it's a very totalitarian country, so it's not easy to evaluate how much uh, 
natural gas resources it has, but it is being expected, let's say, that the reserve of natural gas in, in Turkmenistan might be the biggest in the world. And uh, therefore, it, uh, to construct the pipeline, it would be better to have a guarantee uh, of Turkmenistan that it would sell some of its uh, natural gas uh, via this uh, way to this consortium of, uh, of government and private uh, investors. When uh, European leaders or American leaders visit Turkmenistan, they say, Turkmenistan leaders say that they would, they obviously pro, uh, agree with the uh, diversifications of new, to Turkmenistan export uh, of natural gas, but there are no specific uh, guarantees ever given. Also, uh, it was very, uh, there was uh, an important economic factor which is not here these days. These countries like Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan were exporting only through Russia and Russia was not paying them enough. It was paying like 50% of the market price until recently, whereas a year ago, Russia very smartly offered to pay a full market price for natural gas from Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan. And therefore, it's, uh, these, can these regimes sort of lose motivation to cooperate also with Western Europe uh, and, and the US. This is another map of this of this same pipeline, so I think we can skip it. Here you see the the investors of the of the uh, at the bottom the investors of the Nabucco pipeline, but it is interesting that the support of uh, Austrian NNV and uh, Hungarian Mall is very unstable. Uh, half a year ago, uh, both of these companies pulled out of the project and they would say they would uh, go for a different project with Russians. Then they were very much criticized by their NATO allies, by the US, for instance, which is very active, or I would say is the only country which is actually active uh, in convincing European leaders for with some kind of uh, unified approach. So th then... Uh, uh, Hungarian Prime Minister actually traveled to Turkmenistan to, to express uh, his renewed uh, interest in Nabucco. But how it is these days, it's really complicated to say because Russia, uh, uh, Austrian and MMV is, uh, is a company which is uh, in very unstable situation because, because all these acquisition goals were, were a failure and there is a lot of political dispute over this company in, Hungary, uh, in Austria. Uh, in Hungary, you also constantly have political disputes. But uh, uh, you see that you don't have enough uh, like major investors. There is still fight for these major players uh, going from BP to Shell, etc., to support this project. Here we can see that uh, Few years ago, Russia came with a competitive project to, for Nabucco, and this using like very smart diplomacy, very smart like some kind of a salami tactic we could call it. It is splitting Euro uh, European uh, uh, interests of European countries, and uh, so you can. Uh, so this blue line is this like South Stream uh, uh, pipeline which uh, I, be, uh, I believe serves, serves uh, mainly to avoid Ukraine, to avoid Poland, to avoid, uh, to avoid Georgia, and all these countries would lose the status of the transitory countries, so other countries wouldn't be dependent on the, on the, on the gas going through these territories. And... Uh, and if you are not a transitory country, and if you are not, if, if the natural gas is not delivered, or oil, whatever, but we are speaking about natural gas, it's not delivered through your territory, you are obviously uh, in a much more uh, weakened position towards Russia, with uh, Russia having impact on your, on your politics, on your, uh, on your regime, and on your, as I mentioned before, 
uh, you don't have to occupy someone with tanks. It's much easier to to have an impact over your business and political culture. Uh, the the pipeline goes goes under the Bla under the Black Sea, and Black Sea actually, in, in some of its part, is uh, is uh, pretty deep, and it's not a, it's uh, it. It, it just shows how much Russia wants this pipeline politically because it's going to be a very expensive project to finance. But unlike Nabucco, Russia already has a deal in Italian, so it's a joint venture company with Italian Eni and Gazprom. And the uh, job uh, of the chairman of the company was offered to former Italian uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Romano Prodi, who was also uh, used to be a chairman of European Commission, but uh, probably refused. But anyway, uh, uh, I also believe that this very close relationship with, with Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi and with Russian former President Putin also have to do much with this pipeline. You can see that uh, you could have seen on the map before that the, uh, the gas would go uh, both uh, to southern Italy through Greece and uh, to the northern Italy through uh, through uh, Croatia and Serbia. Uh, this is another pipeline, which is uh, which uh, what is interesting uh, on this pipeline. You can see it on the map that it's basic, basically avoiding any territory between uh, uh, besides uh, besides Russia and Germany. So it's also a project that has been approved a few years ago. It, there is already a company which is registered in Switzerland, and you can see a similar pattern that the job which has been offered to Romano Prodi in case of South Team was offered to former uh, German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, who, unlike Romadi, Romano Prodi, accepted the job and is a chairman of the shareholders committee, which is something very uh, strange. I don't know if it means a chairman of the board or of chairman of the supervisory board, but it's a chairman of shareholders committee. And uh, uh, so uh, Mr. Schroeder, at times when he was still a prime minister in Germany, was very much promoting this project and was working hard to get financing for the project. Once again, it's a joint venture company between Russian Gazprom and, uh, and some Holland investors. Five persons are, I believe, Danish investors, and the rest of it is... Uh, uh, the, but main investors are German, uh, is, is German EON and Russian Gazprom. Originally, Finland was participating in the project, but then it pulled out from the project. Sweden is a very harsh opposer of the, an active op, uh, opponent of this, of this project, and uh, not only from security reasons, but also from environmental reasons. <clears throat> so, whereas uh, the South Stream support pro, uh, 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 pipeline is going to use like high-tech Italian uh, technology for uh, with, with, uh, because it's not it's 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 really is high-tech technology to uh, to construct a pipeline. It's not only these pipes and tubes. Uh, the northern uh, North Stream is uh, using sophisticated German technology, but uh, you know that all these Baltic Baltic countries are very environmental friendly, so it's uh, they are still struggling to. To, uh, against uh, fighting the project in these uh, terms. Uh, so unlike, unlike unclear financing of uh, Nabucco, the, the financing of these two projects is pretty clear and it seems very probable that these projects will be finished. Obviously, if it makes someone furious, uh, it's Poland. Uh, Pol Pols, informed Poles are getting wild if they hear about this Nord Stream project. It is slightly less uh, hot political topic in Czech Republic and Ukraine, but uh, it also is very uh, important for these countries because they would lose the status of transition countries. So 
So uh, Russians will export natural gas to Germans, and Germans are these like reliable partners. They can do business with each other, but uh, these other countries have to be sort of obedient, or they have to feel obedient uh, because uh, there, are, there is no uh, another customer uh, after them. This is another map of the Nord Stream project. Yeah, I showed on the map that we are, I'm constantly talking about some uh, very negative and dangerous scenarios, so there are some positive examples, and one of the most positive examples doesn't unfortunately have to do with natural gas, but it's an oil pipeline, and uh, it's called BTC, Baku Tbilisi Cyan Oil Pipeline, and it is actually the projects of this pipeline and financing of this pipeline it's uh, started like at the beginning of 1990s, and uh, it start. Uh, it is fully operational. Like since basically, it started to work two years ago. Fully operational. It is a year, it is a year ago, but uh, uh, it is already working. And it's by by the way helping us these days because I should also mention that. Uh, even though these are contracts between private companies, uh, after Czech Republic signed a contract about American ra radar station on its territory, uh, deliveries of Russian oil fell into a half, but uh, we fortunately have not, are not directly dependent with oil only on Russia because we have some route which is going from Adriatic through Germany. So we are actually using these days Azerbaijani uh, pipeline uh, Azerbaijani oil, which is coming like through this, through this north uh, territory, but once again, it's very, uh, it's almost impossible to disclose the numbers because it's not sta state who is doing this trade. But somehow, uh, it is being admitted by our government that uh, Russia uh, halved its uh, its deliveries of oil. But uh, so even Czech Republic is these days is uh, is able to use these. Uh, uh, back, uh, BTC uh, pipeline. Uh, also, what is very important about this chart is, is the number of uh, investors which are involved in this project. You can see that all the big players are involved in it. It's not easy to finance the pipeline, and if you want to finance the pipeline, you should have m more or less everybody on the market to support it, because uh, it's also these projects are also obviously risky because uh, and it's a very big uh, you invest all the money at the beginning but you have you wait many years before before the, uh, you wait many years for the profit so it's also a question of banking financing etc so the reason i'm talking about it is that if the nabucco alternative project for russian gas is ever to be constructed it will also need a similar number of important investors from around the world to participate unless it uh, is going to be a failure. So uh, it, what is it like we can we should be like afraid of, uh, of uh, Russians or why should we be afraid of Russians in Central Europe? It's not only like political culture, it's also the fact that, uh, and we could have seen it on the example of Ukraine and Georgia, that uh, it is very possible that Russia will want to participate in privatization of important companies or would like to buy strategic companies which are already privately owned, but it uh, would like to control them. So I can Im easily imagine the situation that sooner or later, when Czech uh, Republic will privatize its uh, electric power monopoly, uh, which is called CHESS, the Russians would submit the highest demand and there would be no way to uh, refuse it because once again we start a political we start political disputes about about uh, about if we should sell strategic companies to Russians or not they can limit our uh, supplies of of natural gas the same goal with we would uh, very soon privatize airlines 
it is being expected that Russians would uh, uh, submit the highest bid. We would soon privatize the main airport in the country, etc., etc. So it is expected that uh, Russians will use this our dependence, dependency as a tool to get access to our strategic companies. And, uh, and uh, the seller needs cost to consumer. Some people who are uh, who don't uh, who are skeptical about things which I say here say like, look, this is all nonsense. Like uh, everyone who wants to sell something also needs uh, co co consumers and customers, and it's uh, very uh, why uh, they would never like stop deliveries to. Uh, to you guys because they need you, they need your petrodollars, but uh, it's, uh, we can uh, see on the example of Ukraine that uh, Russia is uh, willing to limit uh, the supplies or half the supplies and, and manipulate the level of uh, supplies with respect to political purposes. Also, uh, Russia is, says that it, if we don't want its gas, it can sell it to China and it is uh, probably right that uh, there will be growing demand for natural gas in China and say uh, so that's that's why they can display these muscles so as far as we know like uh, and I can speak about briefly about example of Czech Republic so Czech Republic uh, similar this Poland is lobbying against uh, against these uh, North Stream and South Stream but uh, it's more in diplomatic uh, chambers and corridors. It's not uh, being discussed that much in public. But uh, it invests a little bit more into oil storages, so new oil storages and gas storages are being constructed. And also it did this like strategic thing that uh, it merged with uh, Russian MOL, uh, our, sorry, our energy monopoly chess uh, merged with, uh, Russian, uh, with Hungarian MOL, which... Uh, and they would uh, create the uh, new uh, joint stock company which would construct new power plants, but these power plants will also be dependent on natural gas, but uh, it depends if it's a Russian gas if, uh, or if it's a gas which is coming from C Central Asia through Nabucco in the future. But uh, partially this deal has been done also to avoid uh, Austrian MMV interest in, in, Russia, in Hungarian mall because it is being said that uh, Austrians are much more friendly with Russians than Hungarians are, but it is uh, still very unclear. And uh, this little thing has been done, but that's, uh, that's about all. And it's also a question if it really li limits the dependency, dependency in Russia. But government has presented it that uh, it uh, had its fingers in this in its deals and it and the reason it had its fingers in this deal to uh, to make also these two companies so big that they would perhaps be too much bigger target also for Gazprom or, or such a company if it's wants to privatize it. But uh, uh, this is our president, Václav Klaus, who is a very leading uh, Eurosceptic. And the reason I have here is uh, his picture here is that on the other hand, when I mentioned the Czech, Czech government is doing something, on the other hand, it's it's very Eurosceptic government that's torpedoing common European efforts on many levels. And that's why it would if it want, would, would prefer to unify European approach on, on energy security, it, wouldn't, it, it is uh, losing potential partners and allies on very, on very stupid uh, known campaigns which have no importance. Uh, here I also mentioned that uh, we have new, uh, two nuclear power plants in our country and uh, one of them is old Russian nuclear power plant, which is fully dependent on Russian nuclear fuel. And second one, Temelin, is a hybrid of uh, old uh, uh, Russian-style nuclear power plant with Westinghouse technology, and it doesn't work perfectly. And there were troubles with, uh, with, with the 
nuclear fuel delivered with, from Westinghouse, technical troubles supposedly, and uh, that's why our energy uh, dominating producer Monopoly decided to renew the contract that Russians would deliver their, with, with their, uh, their uh, nuclear fuel even into the second nuclear power plant. So whereas uh, the nuclear power is basically the only alternative uh, which, would in the, which could in the future limit our dependency on the natural gas, under this government, which is very Eurosceptic and anti-Russian at the same time, dependency on, on Russian energy is growing because since next year we would get also uh, Russian uh, uh, nuclear fuel. Yes? Yeah, yeah, I would explain it. It's, it. it's also an interesting, I read a few articles about it, yes. Uh, it's, we are at the end. So, uh, but uh, I have to respond. So, uh, so should I respond to the question after I finish? Because it is, it is with wind energy, it is actually proven that uh, as far as wind energy, uh, you have to have some backup facility because the, you, you don't always have wind, right? And this backup facility is usually coal-based, or natural gas based. If it is coal based, you have to keep a certain limit uh, of coal burning and when the wind stops, the backup facility is started and delivers energy into the network. But uh, it is not economic, it is not environmentally friendly and it is not very effective to use uh, coal power plants as a backup facility if there is no wind. So it's much more easier to have a backup facility based on natural gas because you can switch these natural gas turbines very quickly and once there is no wind, the, there is electricity coming from this backup facility. So some theories are saying that that's the reason this wind energy is being promoted so much because it's actually also serve interests of, of natural gas exporters, not only Russians but other natural gas exporters also. So these things are very complicated. So uh, the, 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 we are coming to a conclusion. The, the, the reason we have this sportsman uh, here is that uh, my prognosis is actually quite gloomy because it seems to me that European governments are, uh, and Czech government at, above all, I would say, are constantly having these like uh, strong words and in reality they are doing nothing or they are doing the opposite. And... Uh, there are really contradictory interests of particular European uh, interests uh, of particular European countries and uh, I, especially in this new financial economic situation I, I don't see any motives for convincing any government and, or taxpayers to finance to finance Nabucco alternative project if Russians are willing to invest so much to the South Stream and North Stream so uh, This is a uh, solution and uh, conclusion. So, and you see that uh, I am i am not normally a skeptical guy, Michael knows me, so I'm very also full of positive idea always, or positive ideas and positive proposals, but unfortunately I cannot see anything positive in this development. It might be possible that if prices of oil and natural gas go down, that it will have a positive influence on Russian democracy or Russian, uh, or Russian political situation because since Russians associate current prosperity with an authoritarian regime, when they will lose this prosperity uh, they, or, or it would be a smaller prosperity, they would ac accuse this authoritarian regime for being responsible for losing prosperity and if Russia becomes from uh, a more uh, diversified, more normal country where the resources are operated by private investors, it would be normal and safe to make deals with them. That's, that's one way. Other way is that Europe forgets its national interests and it will come with a common approach. But if you look at the papers of European Union these days, it, they, it's, it's, they agree with everyone. 
European Union Speaker or uh, Commissioner for Security says, Nabucco is a great project which will help uh, diversify resources and European Union is supporting Nabucco, in words only. But they also say South Stream is also a perfect project. It's also good for European Union security. And they also say North Stream is also perfect. So everything is perfect and no one is actually doing anything in practice. So the third is it's a joke that we could uh, believe in miracles. And it's not an American grizzly, it's a Russian bear. Yeah. Okay, so well, thanks. Thank you very much for coming. Those of you who would like to uh, uh, ask uh, questions, raise questions, uh, please uh, feel free. Uh, you can uh, answer them in uh, itself. We do have uh, uh, questions uh, concerning uh, the uh, uh, natural gas pipeline. Russian uh, uh, I think maybe it's a sign of Jan's uh, uh, thorough uh, uh, coverage and attention to all the nuances of the problem. That, uh, okay, here's a question. I, yeah, I was wondering, because uh, uh, the thing we think of Russia is, is one where uh, the utility comes from uh, Russia itself. That, that's where that the dynamic, the, the, the sort of the dynamic element seems to be Russian all the time. Like so, you know, either Russia becomes nicer, or everybody else suffers, right? I mean, that, and, and I was wondering if a more sort of uh, engaging diplomacy, say, from Europe, like say, take for example the Czech Republic, uh, which recently experienced. We experience what? Yeah, all, all the European countries experienced this uh, cut off uh, two years ago when we, oh, during okay. disputes with Ukraine, yes? Yeah, no. France, Italy, everybody. I was, I was, uh, I think it was maybe a month ago. It had to do with. Yeah, with oil, yeah, it was oil, yeah. Obviously. Well, uh, we, we believe that this installation, it's, uh, it's not against Russians because Russians have so many missiles that it's impossible to, to have a major impact on Russians with one little radar. We uh, tend to believe that Americans are not lying to us, that it's an installation which is supposed to protect Europe against a possible missile attack from Iran, maybe if Pakistan is taken over by whatever, like, but it's not an installation which is against Russian missile. That's, if, that's what Russian says, Russians say. But we, uh, on the other hand, you are right that some politicians say that it's, we need it because we like to have American soldiers on our territory, which is something what Russians don't like. But uh, I don't know, I am not a ballistic missile expert to, to know if it, if it could be used somehow uh, against Russians. But, but in rhetoric, as far as what is in, in the government contract with the U.S. government, there is nothing against Russians. It's not, it's not uh, aimed at Russians. It was, but it was very obvious. Was, uh, obvious. What does it mean, obvious? I don't know. Uh, uh, well, it's been, been talked about for like the last year. Uh, it, it was obvious that, that the Russians would react, in a, in, 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 that there would be a conflict by, by something of this nature. And what the, the expediency of having Uh, given Russia's assurance that they accomplished nothing in the 
agreement to it. Uh, and that, it, it, you know, it, it wouldn't cost them, there's no uh, opportunity cost to becoming uh, hostile, but to becoming... Yeah, but on the other hand, as I mentioned, like before, like this, uh, it doesn't directly have to do that much uh, with what I was presenting in the lecture because the contracts for uh, North Stream and South Stream were were uh, made like three years ago. Basically, the construction is as uh, basically the or, or there is a lot of preparatory work being done for the construction which is going to start very soon for both projects. So you cannot uh, relate it directly to some American radar on Czech territory. It's a, it's a long-term Russian diplomacy, which on the other hand, I, I must say, is very smart. Russian diplomacy is very smart and very, very efficient. I think that it's uh, almost a genius plan to, to have these like two former politicians, for instance, to be to, in Italy and Germany to participate in these projects, it's, it's, it's a system, you can feel that it's a system, and it's a very sophisticated system, and, and, uh, and it doesn't have to do directly with radar or no radar. Here we have another uh, question, uh, up here. Yeah, well, there's been a concern in recent years that the, the system was already overloaded, and that the Russian gas industry is inaccessible to Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's. Well, I don't know about th that directly, but it's it has to do with something with something which I uh, didn't mention enough because I can uh, it's it's uh, relates to too many topics, but. Uh, you can also see that what Russians are doing with these pipelines, they are also do it, doing it with foreign investors on its own territory. They need foreign investors for these new technologies and for these new things, but they carefully pick up. Italians are welcomed and is participating in, in projects in Russia. Germans are welcomed. Brits are forbidden, just recently have been expelled from this co foreign company. So you can see that Russians and it has to do also with the fact which I was mentioning before, like with an approach of Russians towards private property and protection of the private property. So if you are friendly and obedient or a good partner, like Italians and Germans, you are welcome. If you are constantly causing troubles like Brits are, you are not welcome. And we could also witness, even though I am absolutely not defending these guys, because if they are called Czech company, they are not Czech company because these companies, huge Czech financial groups are registered in Cyprus or Holland, are also investing a lot into particle projects in Russia. And you can see when there is a dispute between governments, these guys are losing in Russian business courts and then they are going to Czech government and complaining that our prime minister should help them even though they are not even registered in the country, so I don't consider them to be a Czech company but they are using it against Czech companies also. So it's very, it's the same tactique, I believe. So is there something of Argentina, are they actively in Germany to invest in? Yeah, of course they do, it's already happening. Yes? Yeah, the, definitely, but I hope, but it, it, it is changing a little bit, but if, as far as I am concerned, um, Michael knows that I was offering him this topic even last year, so I, I, was inter I am interested in it a long time, but uh, on the other hand, like approach of France and Germany is changing, but once again, it's changing only in the rhetoric, it seems to me. There is... There is no way that anyone would stop like South Stream proje project or North Stream project for being finished. Especially now where there is no money anywhere in here in, in Europe, there is a crisis. No one would uh, finance some project which goes basically the same way. So 
even German Chancellor was uh, Angela Merkel was criticizing Ma Russia a lot for what it did in Georgia, which I was pleasantly surprised. But if she would say like we would uh, have to reevaluate the I don't know North Stream or something, that would mean something because it would really hurt Germans because it's very easy and it's possible to lead these uh, pipelines through Poland and it would be much cheaper. The only reason for constructing these, or the same goes for South Stream, because it's, it, it is very environmentally unfriendly and it is much cheaper to construct it ag against across Poland or Ukraine. So there's... The second question relates to this. Uh, it's not only Europe uh, which is affected, uh, but Russia and Ukraine are also affected. Uh, Russia has collapsed. Yeah, that's what I said. They made, that's, that's the only hope that, that perhaps if people in Russia get angry, so they would get angry with a semi total or out, they would get angry with an authoritative regime and perhaps they would demand more democracy. That's a long time. But I'm talking about money. Uh, South It's a question because like we are speaking here about I don't know uh, 10 billion dollars for each of these projects, maybe 12, maybe, I don't know, but this, uh, but uh, we know that Russia has like hundreds of billions of dollars of, uh, of reserves in these special funds and gold reserves. And so it is, uh, it is strategically very important. So I believe that Putin will, uh, and Medvedev will put money aside for these projects because from long-term perspective, the, these are very, very, I don't know, if, if I was Putin or Medvedev, which I am not, I would also put, perhaps like push for these because it's, if, from what they wanna do and how they, uh, how they like, uh, what their vision of Russian society is, for them it is, uh, it is extremely smart what they do. It's, if you, based on intelligence only, it seems to me. I think it has to do with Poland. It doesn't have to do with Belarus. Uh, I think there was, and there was also a dispute with uh, with, with Belarus about oil and and the deliveries also lowered. But I think my theory that it was a fake to show that they don't they don't criticize only Ukraine from strategic reasons, but they have a harsh dispute with every consumer who is not paying in time or something. So I think it was supposed to divert attention, I believe. So the Germans would say there's an advantage in having a direct pipeline so that the Russians get mad at the, at the Poles and the Russians get mad at the Poles, they will, they will be able to retaliate against the Poles without... They will, they will be able to stop the, uh, the deliveries of, of gas and into an extent of oil to their former satellites without damaging more important Western European business partners. All right, well, thank you so much for your sobering words.